Welcome to the MSU Deer Labs online seminar series brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. My name is Steve Damaris and I'm the Taylor Chair in Applied Big Game Research and Instruction at Mississippi State University. Thank you for joining me. This presentation is not about habitat management per se, but let me give you just a couple of nuggets uh, to uh, give you an indication of what you'll see in some other of our seminar series that are focusing on active habitat management. This is just some of the potential things you could do. There's an aerial photo taken from our lower coastal plain of Mississippi. You see a lot of active pine management. If you look close, you see clear cuts. You see uh, recently replanted clear cuts. You see uh, stands that have been thinned uh, mid-rotation, and you see some stands that are canopy closed and ready for a final harvest. So there's a lot of management taking, a, taking place in this landscape. Mid-rotation management is an important stage in pine plantation management that you can really take advantage of as a deer-oriented land manager. One of the problems in the southeast with pine stands is mid-story hardwoods. And even if you thin a pine stand and open up the canopy, if you have mid-story hardwoods, that mid-story is captured by the hardwoods. And so there's no sunlight that is going to be allowed to get down to the ground level. And remember earlier in my, this presentation, what's the level at which deer worry about food supply? Five feet and below. If it's not being produced five feet and below, then it's not available to the deer. So these sweet gums are not good deer forage and they're up in the mid story anyway. So they're not allowing sunlight to get to the ground where the deer need it. So in this particular study, this is the results of, a, of a, uh, some of our habitat management work we've done here at the MSU Deer Lab. We applied an herbicide called amazapir. It's a selective herbicide that kills certain plants and not others. We followed that treatment with a prescribed fire the following winter, February, March time period, with a, what we call a, a cool season prescribed fire, and stimulated germination of new forage. Now, how frequently you conduct a prescribed fire will affect what type of forage class you will produce. If you're interested in, say, uh, northern bobwhite or bobwhite quail, you want to come back with a fire return interval of one to two years because that's going to uh, promote grass production in your landscape. And that wouldn't necessarily be advisable if you were interested primarily in deer. If you want deer, then a three to four year fire return interval is going to promote forbs and browse. And if you're interested in turkey, you'd probably want to go shoot for about a three-year fire return interval also. So prescribed fire, I got off talking about different species fire return intervals, but uh, the point is you get rid of the mid-story hardwood competition, which benefits your pine growth, and also uh, follow that with fire, and you're going to improve your forb production and your woody vine production. This is a, a stand that we treated with that amazapir and a prescribed fire. This is the second growing season, and you see an abundance of forb growth and also woody vines. Uh, you can see some woody vines growing up the pine, uh, that right-hand pine tree. You can see a Virginia creeper. Looks like uh, Virginia creeper growing up there. Uh, you got a bunch of good palatable forbs growing in that lower canopy and if there were a person standing there you'd see that that can that lower canopy is about four feet up into the air and uh, well within reach of deer now we looked at the forages in this stand that would port and be eaten by deer and we calculated something called a nutritional carrying capacity and this particular study we conducted in the upper coastal plain and we looked at the arsenal and burn, that's the, the mazapir and fire treatment compared to a stand that 
or actually six different stands that were thinned and not treated with arsenal and burn. So we, we had we did this study in six different pine stands and we looked at the, the amount and the quality of deer forages and the treatment where we thinned the pines, treated the midstory and burned, ended up producing about 85 deer, deer days per acre of land. And so that, that means 85 deer could live on that acre for one day or one deer could live on it for 85 days, but deer days per acre. And then compared to the control where we, we thin the stands but did not control the midstory and did not burn, there was still deer food on the stands. There was about 30 deer days of carrying capacity per acre. So one deer could live for about 30 days. So 30 days versus 85 days. That's an almost threefold increase. Almost threefold increase. What kind of increase would you like to get from your stock market investments? Boy, if you could increase threefold, you're, you're doing a great job. And we were able to have a two to threefold increase in the nutritional carrying capacity in these mid rotation stands of pines in the upper coastal plain by applying some smart management. Here's another potential habitat management action you could consider applying on your property. Rainer Nichols is one of our graduate students here at the MSU Deer Lab. He wanted to look at the timing of prescribed fire and how that could affect crude protein during the summer. I've already mentioned how dormant season fire is a great tool to stimulate vegetative growth. So we wanted to see if we could customize future habitat management recommendations by kind of teasing out how a dormant season burn might affect habitat quality compared to a summer burn. His results showed pretty dramatic effects on late summer crude protein content of deer forages. On the left axis, the vertical axis, it's crude protein percent, and, and there's two years worth of data. 2018 is the first year that we did the study. The control was nine different thinned pine stands, and then the dormant season burn was applied late February, early March of 2018, and then there was a growing season burn applied during June of 2018. The quality of forages in the control in both years was roughly the same. The dormant season deer forage quality was a little bit higher in 2018 than the control. However, the late summer crude protein content of these deer forages sampled in the plots where we did the June prescribed fire, the content was much greater than the forages in the dormant season burn and also in the control during that first year. Fire is a stimulation of new growth, but it doesn't continue to have that effect after a year or two. And you can see in the second year, the dormant season fire and the growing season fire protein contents of those individual deer forages were back down the same as the control. So it's a temporary effect. And you also lose a little bit when you do a, a growing season burn, as shown in this analysis of summer crude protein nutritional carrying capacity. The year of the burn, when we did the February dormant season burn, the nutritional carrying capacity was much greater at the end of the summer statistically greater, more than double that of the control, but it was also more than double that of the growing season burn. And that's because the growing season burn knocked back the vegetation that had grown since green up and it burned it back. And so it's not surprising we expected this effect, but the overall nutritional carrying capacity on say an acre of land that is burned during June is not going to be the same nutritional carrying capacity as they would be if you had burned in February. However, that nutritional carrying capacity does respond very positively in the next year, the second growing season after the June burn. And so what we see here is how you can vary the timing of a prescribed burn. One, 
in June to stimulate late summer high quality forage, but in small quantities. And then in the dormant season, you can burn to stimulate greater nutritional carrying capacity overall for your property if you're doing both of these management techniques. And so it's just a matter of optimizing, burn some in February and then burn some in June. So what we're talking about here is diversifying fire timing and optimizing nutrients across your property. And there's some benefits to diversifying your fire timing. If you spread out the time in which you have to do it, you're also allowing yourself more opportunity to do it. Spreading it out and, and not planning to do it all in that dormant season will allow you more opportunities. June burn, you're gonna provide some very high quality forages to meet those specific nutrient demands. And if you time that fire right, maybe very, maybe do it a little bit later than June, say in July uh, or early August, you can actually stimulate that new fresh growth later in the summer or early fall, say around late September or early October during bow season. And we showed very clearly in, in Rainer's work that potential attractive technique and by varying the timing of burning across your property, you can really optimize nutritional carrying capacity, provide high quality forages in localized areas to bring those deer in when you want to see them. Another project that Rayner worked on during his thesis was looking at localized nutrient patches and trying to create them using stump sprouts. The picture on the left shows a problem that a lot of properties have. If you have a closed upper canopy, there's not much sunlight getting to the ground and you end up with limited forage for your deer population as shown in this right hand photo taken right below the left hand photo. You don't have much sunlight, you're not going to have much forage. There's a lot of good reason to think that stump sprouts can create localized nutritionally improved forage. We know that woody plants generally have evolved to re-sprout after being top killed. Whether you're cutting it or burning it or whatever, woody plants tend to re-sprout. And the, the quality of the re-sprouts is tied to the root to shoot ratio. Because you remove the upper biomass, you have all the nutrients that are left in the roots and then they need to move up out of those roots and you have some really high quality stump sprouts. You may have seen some of our uh, video releases starring uh, Marcus Lashley talking about mineralized stumps. And that initial work is what led us to work on this topic with Rainer's thesis. And we know that herbivores generally are adapted to exploit these types of resources. So it's really a good idea because by creating these stump sprouts, you should stimulate the crude protein content and essential nutrients like phosphorus. And also these stump sprouts tend to have a reduced physical defense against herbivores or deer in the young leaves. They're more palatable. They don't have as many secondary plant compounds and you bring the stump sprouts down within reach of the deer. So it's really a great option for a localized impact by an individual hunter who's trying to bring deer in close to a hunting area. Looking at Rainer's results, the stump sprout crude protein, we did this for three species of trees. Black gum, which is a highly preferred forage here in Mississippi. Red maple, which is a moderately preferred forage. And then sweet gum, which is not preferred at all. And preference of deer for a forage oftentimes is related to the crude protein percent. And if you look at the control, uh, black gum is much higher. It's about 15 and a half percent compared to red maple, which is about 13 percent. Sweet gum's down around 10 percent. So there's a clear protein content in the black gum over red maple over sweet gum, but that's just the natural leaves up in the midstory. Once we removed that mid-story tree and brought it down to a stump level, the stump sprouts really responded well. And black gum, the protein increased from about 15 and a half up to near 18% in both the first year and the second year. Both years, the red maple stump sprouts were much greater crude protein than the mid-story leaves that were 
mostly out of reach and we brought those thumb sprouts down so that this crude protein is available for your deer. And then looking at the sweet gum, we went from a very low sweet gum crude protein content to a significantly greater crude protein content in years one and years two. And if you remember earlier, I showed you a video of deer foraging on stump sprouts and you saw them foraging on black gum, red maple, and even sweet gum. So improving the crude protein content of those stump sprouts may have actually increased the palatability of a non-desirable woody species. And stump sprouting improves the phosphorus content, and that's why we refer to stump sprouts as mineral stump. I want to just summarize what we've talked about. First off, we want you as habitat managers to promote high quality forages. You need to do this spatially across your property and temporally, meaning seasonally in one season versus another. We need to focus particularly in summertime in southern states because that's when there's a nutritional bottleneck in most habitats. And by diversifying the treatments that you apply across your property, both in space and time, you can optimize the quality of forages. And with this effort, you want to try to fulfill those deer nutritional needs related to their various life stages. Bucks growing antlers, does producing fawns, nursing the fawns, and then that young fawns growth early in its life. I've shared with you a few habitat management actions you could try. Each of the things we've talked about should increase species diversity of the natural vegetation. Prescribed fire is great for that. We've shown you how you could stimulate seasonal growth and also create localized patches for improving nutrition and attraction of deer to localized areas. Now, I just touched on these in this seminar. We have much more detail in other seminar presentations. And I'll mention here also supplementing that summertime nutritional limitation with some well-planned summer forage plantings. And that's also talked about in other seminar series. If you've liked what you've heard today, I suggest you go to the msudeerlab.com. We have a lot of great information under various tabs talking about deer biology and deer management. And then we also have a series of Deer University podcasts hosted by Bronson Strickland and myself. We talk about the science of deer management and relate it to how you can apply it in your management program. We also have a series of smartphone apps. It's been really nice talking with you. I appreciate your time and thanks for joining me.